Hi, um, I'm back and this time I'm going to talk about the impacts of temperature on soils. So this is content also from chapter seven, but this is the last half or the second half of chapter seven. So starting with section um, 7.8, which are processes affected by soil temperature and then going through other sections um, like absorption and loss of heat energy, thermal properties of soil, um, soil temperature and soil temperature control. So the last half of chapter seven, which are the sections um, that talk about temperature. And again, in the fourth edition that starts with um, section 7.8. Okay, let me share my screen with you guys. Okay. All right, so um, basically the temperature of the soil is not the same as the temperature of the air. And I think many of us have experienced this before um, on a day when it might be sort of a spring day when it's warm outside, but then the ground is still cold or even frozen or on a summer day where maybe the soil feels warm on our feet in the evening after the air temperature has cooled down. And so, it's important to remember that the temperature that you are experiencing as it being up above the soil is not going to be the same as the temperature that is experienced by the soil itself and then also of course by the organisms and the other components of the soil. And generally, um, the closer you are to the surface of the soil, the more the fluctuation in temperature is. So the closer that soil is mimicking the atmosphere, and again, it's not exactly mimicking the atmosphere, but it's gonna be closer to that. And then the deeper down we go in the soil, the more disconnected um, that soil is gonna be from what's going on in the environment. So basically these deeper soils are essentially like insulated from changes in temperature that are experiencing in the atmosphere. And then also there's a little bit of a lag time where basically the deeper um, you are down in the soil, the longer it takes for temperature to change. So if the air temperature spikes, um, maybe at two o'clock in the afternoon, the surface temperature might spike around that time. But then as you go down a few feet, the influence of that hot temperature at 2 p.m. might take a while to make it down um, to temperature deeper in the ground. So in this particular diagram, it's showing ground surface temperatures and then temperatures at two foot depth. And you can see this peak in this particular diagram is showing kind of annual swings, but we would also see this on a much um, less pronounced um, scale throughout the day. So it's showing in this case, August 6th is the peak ground surface temperature. And then it's a couple weeks later that that energy makes it down two feet in the soil and we have a peak um, surface um, temperature below the ground and then five feet at five feet depth um, it's even a greater offset a whole month later and then at 12 feet foot depth it takes even longer for the energy to get all the way down and so the peak temperature below the ground at a um, depth of 12 feet is considerably offset, more than two months offset from what's going on in the surface. And then again, we see this kind of thing throughout the day too, um, probably not at a um, depth of 12 feet, but if we are going down just a few inches in the soil, we might have um, kind of a peak um, energy um, input and warmth, like a foot down in the soil, maybe several hours after the the peak temperature at the soil surface and the peak temperature in the air. So um, basically, yeah, there's just this lag time between the surface temps um, and um, the deeper soil temps. Okay, so what are the kinds of things that are influencing how hot the soil gets? Well, one of the main things is what's called the albedo, um, which is just kind of an earth science term for reflectivity of soil. And sometimes this is reported as a percent, how reflective a surface is between like zero percent being absorbs all energy isn't reflective at all, and a hundred percent being reflects all energy. But also often albedo is um, reported as a number between zero and one, where one is basically like 100% and zero is like 0% and then 
you know, numbers like 0.5 um, or 0.2 would be kind of halfway in between. So generally the rule is that darker colored soils absorb more energy, okay? So they look darker to us because they're not emitting as much light, but then they're also probably not as emitting as much heat. Okay, so they're gonna have a lower albedo, something on the range of like 0.1 or 0.2, which would be about like 10 or 20% of energy that they absorb is being reflected. So 90 or 80% of the energy that they absorb is being, or that they come in contact with is being absorbed and all that energy is serving to heat them up, right? And then light colored soils are much more reflective. They might have an albedo of something like 0.5. Um, and so they're reflecting about half of the energy that comes their way and so they're not going to get as hot and i think we've all experienced this if we've stepped on one dark soil but also something like a asphalt like a dark asphalt parking lot in the summer we know that that surface can get very very hot and that's because of the dark colors um kind of low albedo um, or high absorbance of energy Okay, another thing that impacts how hot a soil gets is the aspect um, on which that soil is located. So we talked about aspect a little bit earlier in the class um, when we talked about um, the influence of relief on soil formation and to, or a, aka topography on soil formation. So uh, hopefully you'll remember that aspect is kind of which direction um, the slope is facing. And so many slopes are either generally facing in a south direction or a north direction. Of course, they can be facing east or west as well, which is kind of an intermediate impact of these two extremes that we'll mention. And in the northern hemisphere, if you're on a south facing slope, you are positioned on a slope such that you are kind of facing the way that the sun's rays are coming at. So you're getting a really direct hit of energy, which warms up the ground more effectively. Whereas if you're on a north facing slope in the Northern Hemisphere, you are essentially in the shadow of the hill slope. And so you are getting a much lower dose of solar energy, even at the same time. And even if you're only maybe like a short distance, like a quarter mile or even less apart, you might be getting a really lower, different dose of um, so solar energy. So your aspect position can influence your temperature as well. Um, another thing is, of course, cover. Um, if you are under a tree or a shrub or even soil that's below a grass, you're going to be experiencing um, a much lower dose of direct solar energy on the soil particles themselves than if you have just open exposed dirt in a type of climate like a desert climate where we just have less vegetation and soils exposed or in an environment where kind of humans have come along and artificially removed vegetation um, like by plowing um, or by creating some other kind of um, you know non natural type of system. So lack of cover could extremely increase um, your temperature, um, could also um, decrease your temperature in the winter. Cover could act as an insulator um, from kind of temperature loss in a winter time. So usually lack of cover is going to be just more extreme shifts in temperature. Um, and then moisture, we're going to talk about um, beyond the slide because this is such an important influence on soil temperature. And basically the idea is that the moisture in the soil or the water content in the soil has a huge, huge, huge impact on the temperature of the soil because water um, uh, is sort of a unique property that has a really big um, or a really kind of special relationship with energy. And the first thing is that um, water in the soil is going to be evaporated even on a cold day um, some of the water molecules are going to end up moving fast enough to get evaporated into a gas. And that process is something that's very energy intensive. So it takes a lot of energy to get some of these molecules to evaporate. And then that energy is not available to heat up the surrounding water or soil. So the more evaporation that's taking place, the less heating is taking place. And then also there's a property called specific heat, which we'll mention more on the next slide, 
but basically that tells us that water is just kind of a unique property that requires a lot of energy to change its temperature. And so where there's more water in the environment, we're gonna have a much slower temperature change experienced. Okay, so um, to kind of go back to that first point, the role of evaporation, on the right hand side, I have a graph. Um, that's something that you might have seen in a chemistry textbook. Maybe you've done an experiment like this in a high school science class um, or a chemistry class um, here at Feather River College. And basically what this experiment does is it puts a thermometer in water and heats that water up. And so sometimes this experiment is even done with having a thermometer that's frozen into an ice cube, frozen water. And then it puts the ice cube on some sort of heat source so maybe that's like a bunsen burner or a hot plate or something and energy is added into the system and that energy at first starts to melt the ice and then when we get to the temperature that we expect kind of the average water molecule to start to uh, melt right which is about zero degrees celsius or 32 degrees fahrenheit then the water will start to melt and at that point there's a little lag where we don't see an increase in temperature of the system, okay? But all the energy is just going into rearranging the structure of the water from the ice version to the liquid water version. And then after that melting has taken place um, and the little container with the thermometer and now the liquid water continues to sit over the heat source, we'll see that the temperature of that system continues to increase in a fairly steady way um, for a period of time and it depends on how much heat is coming into the system, how long that process will take, um, but for a while we'll see fairly steady increase in the temperature of the water until all of a sudden it gets to the boiling temperature, which is 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and then all of a sudden we'll see this long plateau where the same amount of energy coming into the system or the same flame or the same electrical heat source doesn't continue to increase the temperature of the water, but instead all that energy that's going into the system is going towards breaking um, these kind of, uh, what are called hydrogen bonds in between um, the liquid water molecules and releasing them into a gas form. And so all this energy put input into the system, which, and it takes a long time to do this, there's this big, big, long plateau um, when you do this, and all that energy is going into evaporating the water. So we know that this translates into the environment as well. All the energy that's beating down on the soil surface, um, even before um, the soil and the water in the soil gets up to 100 degrees Celsius, um, a lot of that energy is going into evaporating water molecules. And so many estimates say that there's only about 10% of the insulation, which is kind of a technical term for the solar energy, that's left over for actually warming up the soil. So when water is present in the soil, that means 90% of the energy is going towards evaporation and only 10% is going to heating. So you can imagine if all of a sudden all the water is gone, then you would have a lot more energy available to heat up the soil a lot faster. And that might be true during a drought period or during the end of a kind of summer season. Um, okay, I guess I kind of gave this away. Are wet soils or dry soils generally cooler? Hopefully um, you can understand by now that um, the wet soils are going to be cooler because lots of the energy is going to be going to evaporating water rather than heating up the soil. Um, okay, so then the second um, part of the temperature component that we already mentioned two slides back is this idea of specific heat. So again, this is a um, concept that you might have been introduced in sort of a high school science class or chemistry class, but the idea is that um, each substance in the natural world has an energy input that is required to cause one gram, right, a, a unit of weight of that substance, one degree Celsius of temperature, okay? And it's not the same. So if you're a rock as opposed to organic matter, as opposed to water, as opposed to air, as opposed to metal, there's gonna be a different amount of energy that's required to change your temperature. And we've all experienced this kind of thing on a playground, 
um, where, you know, maybe it's somewhat of a mild day, 75 degrees outside, and you're walking around and it doesn't seem that hot, but then all of a sudden um, you or your kid kind of touches the metal slide and you realize it's way hotter than the air and maybe way hotter than like the um, wooden steps up to the stair or the plastic seat on the swing or the wood chips on the ground or the grass. All these things are totally different temperatures because they have different specific heats. They have different relationships with the energy that's coming in from the sun on this particular day. So water has a really, really high specific heat, which means it requires a lot of energy to change its temperature, much more than any other natural substance. And so in this particular picture of the park, the grass is probably going to be the coolest surface on a sunny afternoon. And in part, that's because the grass probably has a lot more water in it than any of these other materials. Um, but again, waters is very high. It requires one calorie of energy to um, increase one gram of water, which is like about the size of like a sugar cube, um, one degree Celsius, and then soils is much lower, about 0.2 grams, and that this is dry soil, okay? So basically it takes five times more energy to heat up water rather than dry soil. So if you put a bunch of water in your dry soil and make it a wet soil, all of a sudden, it's going to take a lot longer to heat up that soil in the same energy input environment on the same sunny afternoon. Okay, so um, one thing that, uh, one way that we might see this in kind of an agricultural setting is that in the springtime, a uh, soil that's pretty dried out might achieve um, temperatures that are adequate for a seed germination before wet soils do. So if, you know, your soils are kind of in the shade and they haven't dried out as much or you're watering them more aggressively, that might actually keep them cooler longer, which may not be kind of an advantage, at least at that time of the year. Okay, so another idea that relates to temperature is heat conductance. And um, heat conductance is basically the conduction or the passage of energy through different materials. Right? Some materials are really good at this, like wire, copper, right? That's why we use them to conduct electricity, which is a form of energy. Um, but some materials are not very good. Down, right? You put that in a jacket or a blanket, it's not going to pass energy very well, so it's going to keep the energy right there next to you, okay? So again, this is something that varies by material. And water is a pretty good conductor of energy. Right? Also, like, this is why you don't want to be out on a lake um, when there's like lightning hitting the ground or some sort of electrical wire gets in the water. Um, you could get zapped. Okay, that has to do, um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it has to do with the conductivity of the water. And then um, soils have a variety of abilities to conduct um, energy in the form of heat, it, but the more space there is in the soil, the less um, effective the heat conductance is gonna be. And again, this kind of depending on the season that you're in could be desirable or undesirable. Generally, we know that compacted soils are undesirable for many other reasons, but um, in the springtime, they might actually be able to heat up faster um, because of the close proximity of all the soil particles. The air in between a kind of more aggregated soil um, or kind of lower bulk density soil may actually slow down the conductance of temperature um, into the soil below the surface. So um, again, compacted soils may actually warm a little bit faster than lower bulk density or higher organic matter soils, um, especially when we first kind of see a lot of sun exposure in the springtime. Okay, so we know the soil changes temperature. We know there's a variety of factors that influence how fast and um, when and how extreme that soil temperature change is going to be, right? Like seasonality, like color, reflectivity, moisture content, aspect, etc. But now we want to think a little bit about, you know, why do we care? So what's the um, impact of uh, or impact on different kinds of soil systems and soil organisms um, in relationship to changes in temperature. 
okay? So first of all, I just wanna say that, um, uh, again, we are organisms that live, you know, five or six feet um, up above the ground. And so we're much more in tune with the air temperature, but what's going on in the soil temperature and sometimes the soil temperature below the surface soil, right, maybe six inches below the soil or 12 inches below the soil is actually the environment that has a much bigger influence on, so on plant processes. And then of course, is also gonna have a bigger influence on the other kinds of soil organisms that are living in that environment below the ground. And generally, um, this is just true of all organisms. Um, we have kind of adaptations to survive in kind of a certain range of conditions in our environments. And each of us have kind of an optimum range of temperatures where we can survive best. And some organisms have a little bit bigger range of temperatures in which they can operate and some have a much more specified range. And in particular, different functions that an organism is trying to do, um, it are going to be particularly influenced by the temperature environment. So for example, um, this is kind of an, a, you, the graph on the right is showing emergence. Um, so like the germination and then emergence of corn and soybean seeds that are planted underground. Okay, and it's saying days until 50% of the seeds in a certain area have emerged from the ground. And it's showing that the temperature um, at seed level, okay, so a little bit below the ground, an inch below the ground, half an inch below the ground, has an influence on how many days it takes um, for the either the soybeans or the corn to sprout and emerge okay and generally the warmer it gets the lower the number of days to emerge is so when you plant a seed it's going to germinate faster until for corn about you know 95 and looks like also soybeans about 95 98 degrees fahrenheit and then beyond that, if you start to get even hotter than that, then you could actually be kind of killing or damaging the seed. And then you're gonna see a slowing of the emergence um, as well, or maybe just kind of a lack of emergence overall. Okay, so basically all different plants have adaptations to you know, do their roles of growing, of germinating, um, seeds of emerging, and they are adapted to do this at certain temperatures. So we know that things like germination and emergence are definitely going to be influenced by the temperature. And you know, any of us who have tried to plant a tomato seed in April know this, just like it's not going to come up if it's too cold. You need to wait till it's warm enough for that seed to germinate and emerge. Um, but then of course, other things that plants are doing like photosynthesizing are also going to be influenced by the temperature around them. And again, that's not just the air temperature, but that's the soil temperature, which is the environment that the plant parts are actually coming in contact with. Um, and again, generally many plants do things um, faster at warmer temperatures, but then you can kind of get beyond that temperature where it's too hot and then you can actually kind of shut down some plant functions. And then of course root function is also really important, right? The roots um, do a lot of important roles of nutrient uptake and water uptake from the soils. And they also have a relationship um, with the temperature of their environment. And they are often going to be able to do things better as the soil gets warmer. But each plant is also going to have a point where the soil will get too warm and then its root function will actually be diminished. And that's not going to be the same for every plant. Plants that live in the tropics are going to have kind of a higher tolerance for warm temperatures or desert environments. And then you know, plants that live in the tundra up in the Arctic are going to have a different tolerance, but they're all going to be influenced by the temperature of their soil environment. So um, in your textbook, it kind of talks about like how you might see this play out in the field. It talks a lot about what happens in the spring where we often have this offset in between the above ground, the air temperature, and then the ground temperature. And so in this example, 
it kind of talks about um, a root function um, relationship with temperature. And it says, as the air warms up in the spring, the stomata, which are these pores um, on the plant, leaves will start to open and that allows um, carbon dioxide to get in for the plant to photosynthesize, but it also lets water out, okay? So the warm temperature shining down on the leaves will um, cause this opening up of these kind of channels for water to get out of the plant. But the below ground environment that the plant is in contact with, that the roots are in contact with, is still gonna be pretty chilly right, because there's this lag in the energy um, between the air, the surface, and the below ground environment. And so the root environment may be still cool for the plant to be properly absorbing water. And so we might actually see plants wilting in the spring when we have warm above ground temperatures but cool below ground temperatures. So there's this kind of disconnect between water loss at the leaves but then an inability to absorb water from the roots to match that. And so that's kind of another illustration of the importance of thinking about how the plant is in contact with this temperature environment that's different than the above ground environment. Okay, um, hopefully you have heard me so far um, already this semester say that there's lots of organisms that live in the soil that aren't plants. We're often very plant focused, um, it, thinking in the agricultural world, um, but there's a lot of different kinds of microbes, which is basically just a word to mean small organisms, um, like microscopic scale organisms. So this could be things like bacteria, but this could also be things like different kinds of protists and sometimes fungi. fungi. Um, and basically um, microbes need to do a lot of the same basic biologic functions that other organisms, including animals like humans do. So one, they respire, they have to take oxygen in, and then they have to use that oxygen to combust sugar to get the energy that they need to grow. Um, they also have an important role in decomposition of you know, organic matter in the environment, which is basically um, the same thing. They take oxygen and then they use it to kind of burn up the organic matter and capture the energy from that organic matter. But that has an important role in nutrient cycling in the environment. And um, in general, microbes have an ability to um, do better in warmer environments or higher temperature environments as opposed to plants. So they're not as likely to be scarred by hot temperatures. Um, however, um, of course, they're going to hit up against a limitation where temperatures just get too hot as well. Um, generally, there's this kind of um, rule of thumb that um, biologists talk about, which says that the rates of biochemical reactions, so that could be things like photosynthesis that we talked about on the last slide, or it could be these processes of like respiration and decomposition. All these biochemical reactions tend to double every time we increase the temperature of the environment by 10 degrees Celsius which is equivalent to increasing the temperature of the environment by about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So generally, as we're getting warmer and warmer, we're gonna have these functions happening faster. Again, with the caveat that at some point, we're gonna run up against a wall where the functions are gonna start to do worse um, when the temperature is so hot that it's kind of damaging cells and damaging systems. But it's important to think that as the soil gets warmer, the microbes are going to be able to work faster and faster to, you know, cycle nutrients and to kind of help plants um, do the growing that they need. Um, okay, so kind of changing the subject a little bit, I want to think a little bit about the influence of fire on soil. So anyone who's lived in this part of the world has certainly First, had firsthand experience or have been aware of these big kind of wildland fires um, that can occur in our forests and um, woodlands and grasslands as well. And um, we know that fire releases an enormous amount of energy as it builds, uh, burns up organic matter on the surface. And um, you maybe haven't thought much about this before, but not surprisingly, of course, it heats up the surface soil environment as well. 
However, the good news um, for our soil scientists that have, you know, put in different kinds of temperature probes and whatnot before fires have burned through, what we've realized is that um, soil is not, as we've already talked about, a great conductor of energy, okay, especially when water is being evaporated um, during a fire um, system. And so there's usually a limit to kind of the depth in the soil that that really high spike in heating is experienced. And usually that's limited to like the top few centimeters or the top inch or so of soil that we see these really hot fire temperatures. And so hopefully um, that will kind of limit the impact to the biologic communities um, within the soil. So certainly some soil organisms are gonna be killed as a fire burns over, but hopefully those organisms that have had the ability to kind of burrow down a little bit deeper or just naturally live a little bit deeper in the soil um, are gonna be able to survive. However, um, one of the big impacts of soil from fires is um, the creation of something that's called hydrophobicity. And basically what happens is um, as the temperatures of the soil spike, so they go up to like over 120 um, five degrees Celsius, um, which again would be like over 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it volatilizes or basically takes from like a solid or a liquid phase and puts in a gas phase different kinds of hydrocarbons. So all this kind of organic matter that's um, in the surface soil, in the O horizon and in the A horizon, gets kind of turned into a vapor form by this really hot temperature. And then as the fire moves past and the environment starts to cool back down, those hydrocarbon vapors start to condense around the cooler soil particles and they kind of form like a greasy coating. Like kind of imagine like you cook bacon, it gets really hot, all this grease gets in the air and then it starts to kind of come down and create this like greasy film all over your stove and other things that are near the environment where you're cooking. So that's kind of, basically what happens during a forest fire and one thing we know is that grease and water don't mix well so now the soil has a property that we refer to as hydrophobicity or we can say that the um, soil is hydrophobic which means it's water fearing or essentially water repelling so then water um, that does come in from like a rainstorm will not be able to successfully infiltrate and then percolate down into the soil but instead it will kind of pool up on the surface and it's being repelled by all these kind of greasy coatings um, that have been created by the hot temperatures that occur during the fire. Um, so um, now when this happens, we start to see lots of um, high erosion potential for soil after fire. Um, and so this is kind of a combination one between the removal of the cover that was kind of protecting the soil before the fire burnt through. So right, the needles, the leaves, the grasses were kind of providing a protectant layer that raindrops were hitting first before they actually landed on the soil surface. And we, when we talked about erosion, we kind of unpacked why that would be important in preventing erosion. But then added to it, now we have this other hydrophobic hydrophobic character of the water that's been created by these greasy hydrocarbons and the combination of those two things together creates this really kind of hazardous erosion conditions or major erosion potential. So um, this is kind of um, from a Forest Service report um, and it's talking about the rates of infiltration that are happening um, on an intact forest floor in inches of rain that can be infiltrated into the soil per hour. So kind of before a forest fire, um, over six inches could be infiltrated per hour. Um, and then basically after, well, when there's some vegetation, um, the, um, the infiltration rate goes down um, somewhere in the range of like 0.2 to two inches per hour. And then when the soil is totally bare, it goes down even more between zero and one. And then if we have a hydrophobic component to the soil, it's gonna be maxing out at 0.04 inches per hour infiltration. So you can imagine 
then we have a whole lot more water pooling up on the surface, moving across the surface as kind of surface flow, and we know that is the water that does the moving and the eroding of the soil particles. Um, another important impact of fire on soil um, that's related to these um, spikes in temperature um, is a change, usually a loss of kind of nutrient availability. So basically what happens is that as the um, organic matter and other materials on the surface get burned, they volatilize or they transform the um, nitrogen, the carbon, and then of course other things as well into gaseous forms and they're released as like carbon dioxide and um, nitrous oxides um, into the atmosphere and it kind of removes them from um, the soil environment and then of course removes plant access to those particular kinds of um, soil um, nutrients. So in this particular diagram it's showing the situation for carbon on the left and nitrogen on the right and then it's showing the, sh the situation at shallow depths so about three to five centimeters depth below the soil so like an inch or two below the soil and then another look at about 15 inches so that's maybe about like or sorry 15 centimeters that's maybe like um, eight or so inches below the soil. And it's showing the line is the pre-burn concentration of these nutrients. So the deeper you go down in the soil, the percent um, carbon content and nitrogen content um, goes down, okay? Uh, and then post-burn is showing how much is left after the fire has burned through. So in, um, in the carbon picture, um, there's actually some release of carbon in kind of uh, um, solid form that's available after the fire burns through, but at, at depth, the access to carbon is um, diminished after the fire. And then on the right, we can see that there's an offset between the line and the gray bar, both in the shallow soil environment and at the deep soil environment, showing that there's this kind of big loss of access to nitrogen um, at these various locations in the soil after the fire. Um, okay, so another thing that is a big influence of fires is kind of the impact on what we call the seed bank, um, which is kind of the seeds that may have been shed by plants in the past that are stored in the soil. Um, so when a fire burns through, obviously it kills a lot of the above ground vegetation. Um, it may also kind of burn down into the ground and burn roots and burn seeds. And so when a really severe fire has come through so much so that it has kind of killed off a lot of the seed bank and killed off a lot of the roots that for some plants may have the ability to re-sprout, that high fire severity and then kind of the wiping out of the plant regeneration techniques or you know capabilities might limit the rate of recovery at that site and therefore increase um, the susceptibility to erosion for a longer period of time. However, there are many plants that live in kind of fire adapted ecosystems, places where fires have continuously been part of the kind of environmental picture for a long time. And these organisms may have adaptations and in some cases might actually require fire to be able to regenerate in a significant way. So some plants actually find that fire is necessary for them to reproduce. And so one of these examples is kind of something that's called serotony. Um, and basically what this means is that some plants have some sort of environmental trigger and, and often in this case, it's the trigger from the high heat that's experienced by the fire that allows the plant to do the regenerating. Um, and then it doesn't regenerate until that environmental trigger is experienced by the plant. So a lot of pine trees, which are adapted to these kind of drier, more fire prone environments, have what are called serotonous cones. And that means that the cones of the pine tree, like the picture on the left, are totally sealed shut and seeds actually are not released from these pine cones 
until a fire happens. And then the heat from the fire kind of breaks down the sealant that's gluing the cone scales together. And after the fire, if you go through, you'll see that the, fire, the cones are opened, like in the picture on the right, and then the seeds have been released. And now these seeds um, were kind of protected or insulated by the cone during the fire, so they didn't get killed. And now the, then the cone opened up, released them, so they fell on the ground. And now they can start to grow a new generation of that species without any of the competition of the older, bigger trees that may have been shading them in. So not all pine trees do this, but many pine trees in the Western United States um, do have this kind of adaptation. So um, anyway, it's just important to know that fire can prohibit regeneration if it's very severe, but at the same time, sometimes fire can be necessary to kind of stimulate these kinds of organisms that are growing in these soil environments. Okay, I think that's my last slide. All right. Um, that's a wrap for soil temperature.